All right, and we back on the forecast. Now, we as a collective have to get out of the poverty mindset. They've instilled a poverty mindset into us so they can keep us in our place. As long as we got to go to them for our food and everything else, then they control us. And they've always used that as a weapon against us. First, they take what's ours, and then they make us being poor a crime. After the 13th Amendment was passed, they made it illegal for black people to be broke, even though all of their institutions are dedicated to keeping us that way. If they found out you were homeless, they would arrest you, your wife, and your children, and then put you back into hard labor with sharecropping. God forbid somebody get hungry and steal a chicken or something. You doing hard labor for life. But then they turn around and paint you as the criminal and tell you to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But anytime somebody tries to come along and show them the way, then they're made the enemy of the state because they never meant for us to break out of a poverty mindset. They don't want us to be out of their control. Back in 1961, a brother Herbert Lee, who was in the NAACP and a civil rights activist, was shot and killed by a white state legislator in Mississippi. Now this brother Herbert Lee was an activist for his people and a known civil rights activist in the area. And his white legislator, E.H. Hurst, who was his neighbor, found out he was pro-black, he would constantly pick fights with him. So one day this brother, who was a cotton farmer, was transporting his cotton gin. And this brother was just sitting in his car, not bothering anybody. Then out of nowhere, this white boy just approached him with a gun. And then as his white boy was pointing the gun at him, he told him to get out the car. But this brother refused and said, I'm not getting out the car until you put down the gun. So after he put down the gun, this brother got out of the car. And then his white boy, E.H. Hurst, ran around to his side of the car and just shot this brother point blank range in the face. This brother Herbert Lee body laid in the street for two hours until the coroner came. Then this white boy, who was a state legislator, claimed self-defense and he was never charged. He said this brother Herbert Lee owed him money and then attacked him. They even forced five people to testify to back up his story to an all white grand jury. And of course they ruled it a justifiable homicide because them killing us in their mind is justifiable. Now, some of the witnesses they got were black and one of them, Lewis Allen, felt guilty. So he ended up telling another activist, Julian Bond, what he had did. So then his brother Lewis Allen met with the FBI and the Civil Rights Commission and told them the truth. But the Justice Department told him they couldn't protect him. So then out of fear, this brother Lewis Allen changed the story back to what he had said before. But by then, the word had already got out that he had told the truth about what happened. So then his brother started getting death threats. He got fired from his job. And people were just randomly attacking him. And this brother just planned on leaving Mississippi with his family. But then he ended up getting arrested. And when the deputy sheriff arrested him, he hit him in the face with a flashlight and broke his jaw. And even though he filed a complaint, it was dismissed. Then the night before he was going to leave town, he went over one of his friend's house. And his friend said he saw two cars full of white people following him when he went home around 830. So then about 835, his wife said she heard three shots. And when she looked outside, she didn't see anything. But this brother had ducked under the car and somebody had shot him and his body was laying there, but she didn't see him. It wasn't until his oldest son got home and tried to move his car and then stepped on his hand did they find his body. And they shot him at point blank range in the face and they could barely recognize him. And of course, nobody was arrested for that either. And the white boy E.H. Hurst kept serving as a legislator in Mississippi, even though he killed his brother in cold blood. Because even though they tell us to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, when we do that, it's a threat to them. And they have to find a way to stop it. But instead, they try to make sure they instill a poverty mindset into us. Because they need us in a position where we're hungry and begging for resources. And will still turn around and kill us if we get hungry and steal a chicken. In Louisiana, a brother Christopher Whitfield was shot and killed by police over chicken and eggs. Now let's go back and see what happened to this brother. The man shot and killed by an East Louisiana deputy yesterday was accused of stealing from that same gas station in Ethel in 2010. That's also when he was banned from the property, according to the store owner. Now, in this investigation, the East Louisiana Sheriff's Office is the lead agency on the case. That means they're looking into one of their own. Our Carmen Poe is in the Alert Center with more. Carmen. 
And Liz, there is an illegal requirement that says a third party, like Louisiana State Police, has to step in on this investigation. But legal experts, um, they tell us that there could be a perceived conflict of interest from the public that could make the investigation difficult. We all have a natural tendency to want to do it ourselves, uh, and so I don't, I don't fault them for that, but uh, certainly that's not what, uh, what the best practice is around the country. The East Feliciana Sheriff's Office says there are no new updates on this case, and while the name of the deputy is still being withheld, East Feliciana officials did tell us the deputy has been with the Sheriff's Office for quite some time, and it's that personal connection to the individual that could have some people in the community weary. Experts say Louisiana State Police are skilled enough to remove doubt in the investigation. The public can trust uh, that it's been done fairly, uh, without any bias, without any conflict of interest. And I think uh, most uh, agencies uh, that have an officer involved in a shooting probably should hand off to the state police. Now, Louisiana State Police is assisting the East Feliciana Sheriff's Office in this case. The family of that man killed by deputies in East Feliciana Parish is called in the Calvary to perhaps help them out with this and try to get answers about what led to this shooting. Our Austin Kemker joins us now with that. Austin, what is Christopher Whitfield's family saying? Yeah, hey Greg, the family of Whitfield, the man killed by deputies uh, in East Feliciana, are demanding that that deputy uh, that was involved in this case be arrested and charged for his killing. Whitfield was shot after he allegedly stole chicken from a convenience store. Sheriff Jeff Travis told us Deputy Glenn Sims Sr. accidentally shot Whitfield in the back after a brief chase. Nationally known civil rights attorney Ben Crump is now representing the family. He called the Sheriff's Department and the DA to go ahead and press charges. They charge people in our community with no evidence at all but to shoot a man running away. He poses no threat to this police officer and the alleged crime taking food we don't kill people in america for being hungry while crump is representing the whitfield family no lawsuit has been filed in this case now this brother christopher whitfield who does suffer from mental illness and is known in the community went to a texaco at about 2 30 in the morning now the store manager claimed his brother stole some chicken and eggs from an outside cooler so they called the police so when the police pulled up on his brother, who was unarmed, he ended up taking off running. So the police started chasing his unarmed brother over some chicken and eggs, and he ended up chasing his mentally ill brother behind the store. So then a cop, Glenn Sims Sr., pulled out his gun and shot at him, what he called a warning shot, which he probably just missed. But then the cop said he caught up with him and grabbed him by the back of his hoodie. So then this cop claimed they got into a struggle, and his brother Christopher Whitfield hit his gun and it accidentally went off and killed him. Now this cop Glenn Sims Sr. said he was struggling and grabbing and fighting his brother, but at the exact same time trying to reholster his gun. But of course with no body cameras, we don't know what happened. And of course this cop is getting his paid vacation, and even though they're supposed to be investigating, they're already caping and justifying this murder. Following up on that breaking news from earlier this morning, the East Feliciana Parish Sheriff's Office is investigating a deputy-involved shooting in Ethel. Liz Coe is live at the scene near the intersection of LA-19 and 10. She's been there since the, earlier this morning. Liz, what have you learned? Lauren, we now know that the deputy, the East Feliciana Parish Sheriff's deputy involved, the one who fired those deadly shots, is now on leave from the agency as this investigation continues. We also know he's a veteran deputy. He's been here for quite some time now, and we did ask the Sheriff's Office how many years. They couldn't tell us exactly that, but they do know that he has been working here for quite some time. The East Feliciana Parish Sheriff's Office Chief Deputy Greg Ferris tells me this all started when two deputies responded to a call about a burglary here at the Texaco gas station on the corner of LA 19 and 10. That was around 2 a.m. Ferris says when the two deputies got here, they met the suspected burglar. Then one of the deputies shot and killed that person. Neither the deputy or the victim have been identified yet. The sheriff's office says they have spoken with the victim's family to let them know about the death. I asked whether anything was stolen inside the gas station and Ferris told me yes, but can't comment any further on that. We also asked whether the victim had a weapon and Ferris told us they couldn't comment on that yet either. Two of our deputies responding to a burglary in progress alarm call. 
and in the course of that incident, um, the suspected burglar was fatally shot. Um, I don't have a lot more details right now. Obviously, we're still here investigating it, and um, along with state police who are assisting us, we'll continue our investigation. The East Feliciana Parish Sheriff's Office is the lead agency investigating this incident involving its own deputy. Louisiana State Police is the assisting agency. Now, typically, when an officer or deputy involved shooting happens, an outside law enforcement agency like State Police can take the lead in the investigation, but there either has to be a memorandum of understanding in place for that to happen, or if State Police is asked to handle the investigation by that involved agency. Now, another cop, Houston Frazee, who was there, but they won't say how he was involved or what he did. They're too busy trying to criminalize this brother. But the police didn't want to say this man was just hungry and took some chicken and eggs. And they definitely didn't want to say this brother was unarmed. And they didn't want to say anything about the cop except he's been on the force for a while. And without any of these details, they still ruled that this brother being murdered was accidental. So it was justified. As if people don't go to jail for killing somebody by accident. Even if it was an accident, which most likely it wasn't. But in this case, after investigating themselves, they said it was okay. Well, shocking developments in East Feliciana after the sheriff admitted a deadly deputy involved shooting was accidental and then revealed the deputy involved had a criminal record. Austin Kemper breaks down all we've learned today. <laughs> Emotions high as family members of Christopher Whitfield, the man killed in Monday's deputy involved shooting, demand answers from the East Feliciana Sheriff's Office. He wasn't protecting the servant, right, he was right, killing, right. killing the servant, what y'all do all the time. The NAACP calling it just another black man killed by law enforcement. It's unfortunate that uh, we have a situation that exists today where our black men are in danger by law enforcement. It consistently happens, and it has to stop. Deputy shot and killed Whitfield behind a gas station in Ethel. Sheriff Jeff Travis confirmed today Whitfield had taken raw chicken and eggs from the store. The sheriff said deputies tried to stop Whitfield, even firing a warning shot into the ground while chasing after him. Deputy Sims was able to grab the burglar by the back of the hoodie. Deputy Sims and the burglar struggled as Deputy Sims attempted to holster his weapon in order to have both hands free to subdue the burglar. The burglar struck the pistol while Deputy Sims was attempting to holster it. The pistol accidentally discharged. The bullet struck the burglar in the right side of the lower back and did not exit. Travis said the deputy who killed Whitfield is Glenn Sims Sr. He has been placed on administrative leave. Sims does have a criminal record including illegal discharge of a weapon, simple battery, and resisting an officer. Now, as far as the investigation goes, Travis doubled down on not turning it over to the state police. He says he's confident in his department's ability to handle this matter fairly. The people of this parish elect me to be their sheriff. There has not been one impropriety or anything that would uh, lend anyone to think that there's anything dishonest or nothing but integrity in this office. The family, not so much. But just as we have been served, God got me. He got me, he gonna keep me in his arms. But I'm gonna get justice for my baby. If it means going to my grave, I'm gonna get justice for my baby. The sheriff says he will turn over all files to the district attorney for the investigation. The DA will then decide whether to take that case to a grand jury. Now it's well known that this brother had a mental illness and the police knew it. And even though they were supposed to be struggling while this cop was holstering his gun, and this brother accidentally brushed against the gun, he still ended up getting shot in the lower back. So somehow he hit his gun and the bullet went around his body and went into his back. And then as much as they try to criminalize this brother, it turns out this cop is the one with the criminal history. And even though the cop is the one with the record, of course they justify this murder because that's how America works. They try to create conditions and then blame us for the conditions they created and say it's our fault, it's a lack of morality. And it is a lack of morality, but it ain't us. But when we start getting on code and understanding we don't have any other choice but to support each other, then we'll be able to do what we have to do. And once we get the right mindset, we can't be stopped. But at the end of the day, we are all we got. And until we get on code and do what we have to do, then the same thing is going to keep happening.
DeKalb Police Officer Robert Olson spending the first of many nights to come in jail. Today he was sentenced to 12 years for killing naked, unarmed Air Force veteran Anthony Hill when he responded to a 911 call about a disturbed man. It is a judgment Hill's family has been waiting for for more than four years to hear. Thousands of you were watching live on our 11 Alive YouTube and Facebook pages as Judge Letitia Deer Jackson sentenced Olson to 20 years, 12 to serve. The former officer faced a maximum of 30 years in prison in the 2015 shooting. It was an emotional day inside the courtroom with tears from family members on both sides. Anthony Hill's mother, father and sister all spoke passionately from the stand. They asked the judge to give Olson the maximum sentence saying, not once did he apologize to them for taking Hill's life. The most powerful moment when Anthony Hill Sr. begged Olson just to look at him to show any sign of remorse for killing his son. Just once I wanted that man to just make eye contact with me. Just, just, he don't have to say anything, but just your eyes can tell whether or not, listen, I'm sorry, nothing. I stood out in that passageway many a day, just hoping, just once, that I can get just a little bit of eye contact, nothing. You don't have to say anything to me. Not one time will you look my way, not just a, just a glance. After the sentencing, Hill's father referred to the jurors as cowards for not convicting Olson of murder. Meanwhile, Hill's mother reflected on getting at least some measure of justice for her son. Even though I didn't get what I wanted, I wanted the maximum. Some time is better than no time. But if I'm truly happy about it, I'm not. But I have to accept what was given. Olson largely remains stoic throughout today's hearing, his wife bursting into tears only after he was led from the courtroom. The DA hopes that Olson's sentence sends this message. There are other non-lethal options that police can use, and a badge and a gun and a uniform are not a license to kill. Naperville City Council is addressing a racist incident at a Buffalo Wild Wings. Black families celebrating a birthday say they were asked to move to another table because a white patron didn't want to sit next to them. Those families publicly sharing their story today. WGN's Kelly Davis, live in Naperville with more. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Joe and Micah. I sat down with the mayor of Naperville ahead of tonight's city council meeting. He says he spoke with the president of Buffalo Wild Wings in person today. He says he is comforted by the fact that the company is taking this racially charged incident very seriously, but also disappointed that it happened at all. We're going into, you know, 2020. And we still have to deal with, uh, I restated, systematic racism. Uh, that, that's probably the most surprising part about it. Justin Vale says during a group dinner at Buffalo Wild Wings last Saturday, managers asked them to switch tables because of their skin color. He asked me what race I was, and, and I immediately was, I was appalled. Uh, I was astonished. I responded, you know, what does that matter? 
And so the host said, uh, well, we have a regular customer here who doesn't want to sit around black people. After going back and forth with management, the group of six adults and 12 kids decided to leave. One of the adults posted about the experience on Facebook, and it went viral with thousands of shares. It quickly caught the attention of Naperville's mayor. It was anger. It was anger, and it was, uh, it was disappointment that this is still happening today. Um, it's just disheartening. The mayor says the racist incident is serious enough to address at tonight's city council meeting. I think our community wants to hear from us. I think they should hear from us, you know, that uh, this type of thing uh, is not acceptable in any community. And I think leadership across America needs to, needs to explain that to people. Buffalo Wild Wings fired the two managers involved and permanently banned the customer who made the complaint from every restaurant. The company is also conducting sensitivity training. But the families question why staff wasn't already trained. Forgiveness takes a while. It's a process. And right now I'm, I'm just beginning that process. You hear about these other stories and you say, ah, doesn't happen around here. This is proof that it does. The group says they are not pursuing legal action at this time, but they are open to the opportunity of working closely with Buffalo Wild Wings to do everything it can to prevent this from happening again. It's six period English at Iroquois High School. Desks and chairs scatter as a female teacher and a male student trade. Blows. Watch again. A different angle. The male student appears to push the teacher first, then she fires back with much more force. I fell over a desk. 14 year old Cameron Jennings says it all started when the teacher asked him to put away his cell phone. She was like, Put your phone up. I was like, My phone's not bothering nobody, so I got to put it up. And she was like, She was like, It's bothering me. Next, he describes a foul mouthed argument. She called me a and that's when I called her. Ending in this explosion. We just kept going back and forth. And that's when she was like, she said, I'll throw your little ass out this window. I was like, you're not ready to throw me out that window. That's when she was like, come here and I'll do it. So that's when I walked up to her. Several sources identified the teacher as Carrie Adams, hired by JCPS in 2016. The district says it wasn't even her room. She was standing in for another teacher. Jenny says they'd had many run-ins in the past. None violent. <laughs> was arrested and charged with assault. Adams is out of the classroom for the investigation. Monday's fight marked at least the third reported assault of a staff member here at Iroquois this month. Well, very concerned. I mean, we're, we're right now overall concerned about uh, the school itself. We now know there was no security on campus at the school when this happened. A recent split vote by the JCPS Board of Education eliminated all school resource officer positions. The district's trying to build its own security force. The spokesperson said the guard only responded after the fight. Obviously investigating that situation and taking action on that, but also going to respond to the school as, as a whole and uh, make um, some necessary adjustments um, in order to correct this. Students ran from the room in the midst of the chaos. Jennings claims in the tussle, the teacher need him in the groin. The fight ended walked to the office. You don't attack a child like that. Yes, he was wrong. He threw the, he hit her. Yes, I got on him for that. He was wrong for that. But everything after that, she had plenty of times where she could have left the classroom or she could have called and got assistance. You're a young man, but you're a man nonetheless who hit a woman. Do you understand how wrong that is? Yeah. I've spoken with other Linwood High School students. Some say they've been in this U.S. history teacher's class, and they say they're surprised. This teacher seems to be popular around here. Some students tell me that at the start of the year, he warned students he does not tolerate fighting in his room. But some say what you're about to watch may have been crossing the line. This video shows a Linwood High School teacher putting a sophomore in what the student calls a chokehold. The 10th grader seen here is Andrew Boyd. I'm just, I'm over here tapping out and he's like, like putting like really hard aggressive gestures and like, like it's a really tight lock and I'm 
tapping on them, just seeing like little pixels and stuff everywhere. After asking several times what sounds like, are you calm? Are you, are you calm? The teacher lets go. Boyd says a verbal argument with threats from another student, but no physical contact between the two turned into this situation last Thursday. The sophomore says he has asked multiple times to be separated from this student. Requesting for me to be removed from the classroom or for him to be removed from the classroom, and there was nothing done about the situation. The young man's mother says she knew nothing about the incident when she picked up her sons from school that day. I picked my baby up at 3 o'clock and no one ever informed me. He didn't say anything because he was afraid that I would react. But the video recorded by another student made its way onto social media and into mom's hands. These are photos Boyd says shows the bruising left around his neck. The family's attorney says it may be enough for criminal charges against the history teacher. For the rest of us, if we're placing a chokehold, it's at least an assault and battery. In a statement, the Linwood Unified School District says the teacher is on administrative leave while the district works with law enforcement in their investigation. Boyd says he just wants life to return to normal without having to be in the same room as this teacher. Mom wants to be at peace when she drops her boys off at school. I want to know that my kids are safe. When I take them to and from school, when I put you in the gate, that's your job to protect them. They weren't protecting him. He wasn't giving what's owed to him. It's a sad reality for this 15-year-old boy that the very place he goes to escape his hardships is also so lonely. It's like a lot of people judge People call me like dumb, stupid, kill myself. For his own safety, we're not identifying who this is. We'll just call him EH. But know this, he's been called the N-word. He's been attacked at school. He threw my crutches to the ground and it was like a fight, a big fight. And then I got my head slammed into the water fountain. And at least twice those fights were caught on video. E.H. is the one underneath the pile, goaded into a fight, then ganged up on. The perpetrators were suspended for this, but so was E.H., and the attacks kept coming. E.H. even requested a transfer to another school, but was denied. Over the course of a year, always reassured that things would get better, they didn't. What would you have wanted the school to do at that point? To hear what we're saying, you know, to to believe us and say that this shouldn't be happening. Well, the first thing I say to the parents is, um, we're sorry that you're not having the kind of experience that we want you to have. Cecil Roach speaks for the school board on this case. It saddens me in a way. It saddens me as a, as a teacher, as, a, uh, as an educator, and as a person. However, I, I do realize that you know, the issue of racism um, is an issue that the whole country is facing. So. I'm not surprised that it's happening in our schools. Our schools are not immune to that, clearly. But EH's mom says the school board failed in its duty to protect her son and is suing the board for a million dollars, a dollar value she believes sends a message. I mean, things will happen in Roach the Roach can't give details about EH's case, but at the board level, he says these matters are taken seriously. Case in point, just this week, 12,000 of the school board's staff went through anti-black racism training. Still... The parent that we've spoken to in this case, when she hears the board say things like, you know, we have zero tolerance mm -hmm. for, for violence, for racism, yeah. I mean, I think she would say that's just not true. Yes, we do have zero tolerance for, for, for issues of racism, discrimination, uh, in, in, uh, in whatever form it takes. However, incidents will happen because, look, incidents happen in society. Our schools are not immune to that. Brushed it away or... Not good enough, mm -hmm. says EH's mom. 90% of the day, our children are with them. We need to know what is taking place. What is their thoughts? What is the outcome? Not at all. And EH's mom isn't sure how this latest legal story will end, but she's pretty clear about what she wants. Someone has to be accountable for these students that are being bullied. Parents are sending their children off to school, and some students don't even get to come home. You wish people would, would listen to you? Yeah, because being bullied is like the worst thing, the worst feeling. The courts can move ever so slowly in cases like this. In the meantime, though, EH's troubles far from over. He's moved schools, but the taunts on social media have followed him. Still, he and his mom are hopeful that there is light at the end of the tunnel, that things will change eventually. 
but those changes can't come soon enough. A longtime Cass Tech teacher is off the job tonight, accused of making racist remarks in class. Detroit schools now investigating what exactly happened last Friday in an economics class. Mar McDonald is live downtown. And Mari, you're hearing the teacher made the remarks as a joke? Well, it was, that's supposedly the context, Kimberly. But what we're hearing from students is that this is a long-term teacher, um, that he is known for saying provocative things in class, um, and if that's the case, and if these alleged remarks are true, well, he's certainly gotten a reaction this time that's landed him in a whole lot of trouble. At first, I, it was like disbelief. When Manisha Hurt's son filled her in on what happened in econ last week, a longtime Cast Tech faculty member who is white got into a conversation with the students, said in a joking tone something that went like this. He said, well, hell, I'm a racist now. And I know that I'm very insensitive to other races. And then he went on to say that he would come up to the school with a white cloak and a burning cross. Hurt couldn't believe what she was hearing. Saying that you would come here with a white cloak and a burning cross, we all know that that symbolizes the KKK. And that's a threat. She reported it to the school Monday, and this robocall has gone out to parents since. The district became aware today of allegations involving the Cass Tech teacher who made racially charged comments. My son said, well, he said it with a smile on his face. I said, I, it doesn't matter if he had a smile on his face. Did you hear what he said? For now, this teacher has been put on administrative leave. Manisha thinks that there should be no return. And if there is? It would say to me, what America, honestly, to me, is about is, is racism. Racism exists. It's real. And to me, I feel like nobody cares. Back here live per the school district. Yes, this faculty member is on administrative leave. Yes, an investigation into these alleged racist remarks is underway. That's an unwelcome surprise for a staff member at Compton Elementary School. They found racist graffiti on the walls there. KKLine's Chris Holmstrom is live at Longfellow Elementary in Compton with how school officials are responding to this. Chris? Yeah, I can tell you staff took action immediately, and it's likely those vandals broke into the school in the middle of the night, then took off. But as you can imagine, this community is outraged by what happened. Racial vandalism on the walls of Longfellow Elementary in Compton. This is what it looked like when staffers arrived to school on Wednesday morning. I'm just really shocked. I mean, I'm just really kind of lost for words right about now. This is a black community, you know, Hispanic community. I don't see why they even come over here and do stuff, something, something like that. Staff immediately covered the vandalism and contacted school police. A disturbing thought for many, including Makai Ali, the Compton Unified School District president. I've been in Compton my entire life, and I've never experienced such a heinous act. Ali goes on to say this is everything the city of Compton is against. A violence is what I'm calling this. Racial threats against folks of any color, sexual orientation, it's not going to be tolerated. We're going to get down to the bottom of it. We're going to investigate vociferously and hopefully bring these folks to justice. These parents agree and have these words for whoever did it. I just think it's sad that, it's, that that type of stuff is still going on. If you're watching this right now, I would just say you just go get a life and get a job and just figure out something better to do with your time instead of being racist. And staff did notify parents. They say they're using this vandalism as a teaching moment for those kids. Parents in Bridgeton are upset after they say a dump truck driver directed a profanity-laced uh, tirade at a bus driver while young children were boarding the bus. At least one parent also heard a racial slur used. Fox 2's Chris Renier is live in Bridgeton where he's been talking with everyone involved. Chris. Sandy, good evening to you. We are at Natural Bridge in Carrollton Court. This is the bus stop where this entire incident allegedly took place this morning. Parents telling us they could clearly hear disturbing language being used. It made me really angry, actually. This mom doesn't want her identity revealed, but she does want to tell her story. She was at the bus stop with her eight-year-old daughter when she says a man working for C&B Paving stopped his dump truck for the school bus as it picked up children. She couldn't believe what she says the man said to the school bus driver. The woman took pictures 
of the driver and his truck. We are not identifying the driver because he isn't charged with a crime. So what I heard the truck driver say verbatim is you effing N-word. Next time have the effing kids wait. And I just sat there like, oh my God, did he really just say this? The woman says several young children were at the stop along with parents. Crystal Seifert was there with her daughter. She did not hear a racial slur, but did hear profanity. I just heard him say, you could have waited to let those little children on the bus. That's effing BS. Pattonville School District spokesperson Mickey Soonover says the bus was taking kids to Drummond Elementary School in St. Anne. Schoonover says the bus driver could tell the man was upset, but didn't hear what he was saying because her window was closed. Schoonover tells me an email about the incident was sent to all of the families with kids who use that route. An administrator at Drummond also met with the children who got on at the stop where the incident took place. Schoonover says some of the students knew the man was mad and at least one child heard some profanity. To hear that um, our students and our staff were potentially um, exposed to abusive and offensive language is disturbing. I want them fired. I want the bus driver to receive a public apology as well as the children to receive an apology. Schoonover says the Pattonville District also notified Bridgeton Police about the incident. Retried twice to get a comment from C and B Paving. The person who answered the first time I called did say that she had taken other calls about this issue today and that she would have someone get back to me. However, I am still waiting. Yeah, and they come. The, hey, okay. Well, I'm videotaping, and the police are coming. So everybody, calm down. Calm down. I, don't care about that I came to the house to speak with an adult, and Thank they you. told me that it was stopped. As soon as we came home, they followed us back down here. They're not even playing at the park. They're standing in the parking lot in front of my house. And they're not even playing at the park. They wasn't sitting at the park. Because he's in the they were not sitting out there. 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 They were not sitting
You black motherfuckers are losers. Damn. Oh, you want to fucking dude. motherfuck fuck with me? Dude, dude, dude. Come on, fuck shit. Dude, black on. motherfuckers are losers. You just fucking dude, with me. Come on. Come on dude. Hey, hey, hey. You're going to hurt yourself. Fuck man. Up. Chill, dude. Fuck off, motherfucker. Hey, I don't give a fuck. Dude, don't me. You don't got your racist I about it. Shit. That's not what Martin. That's not what Martin Luther King was fighting for. You fucking mother black fuckers are. You Damn! Oh man, you're an idiot. In the Shut war. up, dude. Oh, you're yeah. Hey, Shut hey, up, dude. Shut up, dude. You're about to get hurt, dude. You're about to get hurt. You are about to get so fucking hurt if you don't shut the fuck up. Martin Luther King was not fighting. Dude, shut up, man. I want to tell you something. Shit, motherfucker. Listen to me. You losers, listen to me. You are fucking losers, black motherfuckers. You want to fuck with me? Come on over. Oh, oh, damn! I got that. I got that shit. Oh, damn! I got that. Come on, dude. All right, everybody, leave. Everybody, everybody, walk away. Damn.